Howdy. We are here with um, our next presentation of Shoebox Conversations. Um, this time joining us is Linda Sue Price, um, along with Shelley Silverio and S. Valley Osborne. Thank you so much, Linda, for joining us. Um, we have so much fun doing these conversations and, you know, talking with our artists and seeing what you're working on, and it's great to have you here. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, so what have you been up to during the pandemic? Gardening. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we I'm hear that a lot. I'm a gardener. Yeah. <laughs> what, um, what have you been gardening? What have you been planting and growing and eating? <laughs> I started out with potatoes, and I got about 25 pounds of potatoes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And then I had um, sugar snaps. And then I had green beans and I've had tons of tomatoes. I'm still getting tons of tomatoes. Nice. I think I've fed Japanese cucumbers to the world. <laughs> just, it just keeps on giving. I mean, I go out there, I went out there yesterday and it was like, where did this come from? They just <laughs> pop out and all of a sudden you've got cucumbers and zucchini and um, herbs. I did a lot of herbs this year. I finally found a good location for herbs. Cool. So, so that was a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. My father was a master gardener. Oh, wow. And, he was, and so I kind of, it's my father's DNA showing up. Did you garden? Because some of your work is surrounding gardening. In fact, I, you know, we're going to look at a couple of pieces. Did you garden before? I've gardened all along, but I didn't really get into it. I mean, this year, because there was nothing to distract me, I really got into it. And so and by getting into it means you have to go out and look at it every single day to find out what happened last night, you know, with yeah. bugs and different things and making adjustments and propping things up and trimming things and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, but you have been going to the studio too. I have been practicing. I, I, uh, I've been wanting to, def I, I work in three kinds of fires, a, a ribbon burner, a crossfire, and a hand torch. And the hand torch has only got two jets on it, and it's used for welding electrodes on. And I haven't been doing that. I've been letting Michael do the welding for me. So I've been, it's, it's a whole different process. So instead of rotating the glass in the fire, you're rotating the fire itself, the torch, you have to rotate it. So it's just a whole different movement and trying to find He's right-handed, and when he demos it, I try to copy him, and it was very uncomfortable. So we finally figured out a way I could do it left-handed, so it's a lot more comfortable. Wow. So I've been practicing that, and then trying to, I figured out oh, a few months ago that I was not in the center of the crossfire, so it's five jets that come to a point, and I was just a little bit too far back, and so I was still getting some funky bends, and so I finally moved it forward, and then I, and then I started getting the bends. So I've been trying to develop my skill set. Okay. So backing up a little bit, because for those who don't know you, you work in neon. Yes. <laughs> so that would explain everything that you just talked about. <laughs> um, and to get started on that, let me go ahead and share, because the first image that I have um, that I wanted to share with everybody, can you guys see it okay? Yes. Okay. Um, is... Um, of course, you in your studio actually bending. So yes. can you... And that's the crossfire. Is Okay, perfect. So can you, starting a little bit before that, what is neon art? And kind of, you know, as, as simple as you can. <laughs> I mean, what... Um, so what is it and how does it work? How do you create art from what you do with what you do? Well, you start with a stick of neon um, that's about four feet long. And if you're bending a pattern, you can trim it down so it's not so long um, to fit the pattern that you're going to bend. But then you go into the fire and you mark the, t first you mark the tube, d depending on how much glass you want to heat. Then you take it into the fire and you rotate it and you want to heat the right amount of glass. You want to get it hot enough and you want to get it evenly heated. And if you fail to do any of those, you get a kink or a twist or something, um, which stresses the glass. And sometimes you can pull it out, but usually you, you're screwed. <laughs> um, 
And so what you do is you put, so you can see I've got this hose hanging out of my mouth. At the end of the hose is a rubber stopper that you put in one end of the tube. And at the other end of the tube, you put a cork. And you do that so you can keep the, a slight bit of pressure in the tube um, to keep it from collapsing as it's heating. Oh, cool. And it takes about somewhere between 10 and 18 rotations in the fire to get it hot enough. And then you would turn around if you're going to bend to pattern, you would turn around and go to the workbench and you would put it down on the workbench and finish putting it into shape. If you bend freeform, you're going to stay in the air and you're going to bend your shape. Okay. So how did you get into neon, to neon art? Well, I grew up in Southern California and we had a lot of neon around. Um, in Long Beach, there was a drive-in theater called the Circle Theater that had this really cool sign. So, you know, we, my parents would drive all over the Southwest and there was all kinds of neon. So I always liked neon and I had collected a piece of neon art and I wanted another piece. And the Museum of Neon Art offers a class. So I took the class and Michael Fleckner was the instructor. And, you know, it's an eight week class and three weeks in, it was like, this is what I've been looking for. And so after the class was over, I kind of kept hanging around his studio and doing another piece and doing another piece. And then um, he asked me, you know, what my intentions were. And I said, I wanted to learn how to bend. And so I took a pipe cleaner and I wrapped it around a pencil and then I popped it. And then, you know, I made this little mock-up of what I wanted to create. And he looked at it and he said, I don't bend that kind of bend free form. If you want to bend free form, you're going to have to learn how to bend. And so I started learning how to bend <laughs> and burnt myself many times, cut myself a few times. And then he started me on a formal, more formal training and showing me how to bend letters and how to do stuff like that. And learning how to bend letters and bending to pattern teaches you control. So you, you start to, so it, it, it makes your, your bending better. And so, but I really, really love the ribbon burner and making all the loops and stuff. And so I am um, finally now giving into pattern bending, I'm doing a little bit more of that. Why? I mean, because, you know, since we've known you, you've been like, nope, not pattern bending to me. I just want to, you know, create without a pattern, create abstractly, spontaneously. So what made you start to bend a pattern? Well, you can see like in the picture there on the, the, the piece that's on the lower left, that kind of like flower shape, that's a flat shape. And so when I bend a pattern, it's kind of like a loose kind of abstract shape. So I don't have to be perfect. It's not like I'm doing a letter. So I started doing things like that where I was doing multiples of that shape and then stacking it up. It's just something different to do. Okay. Uh, how much of the appeal, Linda, for you is the technical difficulty? <laughs> I wish I was a master bender and I could do anything I wanted to do. Um, you know, the, the technical part, like for a lot of people, the wiring is difficult or the um, doing the animation, creating animation. But because I worked in video production, you know, and I put together multi-camera shoots and edit based wiring, I know how to read schematics. So that wasn't really an issue. The, the, biggest challenge for me has been working with my hands and um, I wouldn't say that I love it but I like having the ability to make the shapes that I want to make and so I'm in charge so I couldn't take what I do to a bender and have them make what I make they would make something it would be different and so, so like the first piece that I did, I designed it and somebody else bent it. And then I started making my own stuff with my own bends and it's entirely different. It does, it's like two different people. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, you know, abstract painting, pouring and dripping and it's our own expression. It's our own, you know, action that we put into the work. And I'm sure it's the same thing. 
you know, mm-hmm. bending spontaneously and abstractly and, you know, while you're there in the moment too. Definitely. Um, so let's go ahead and look at some work. I wanted to show this piece first. I know it's kind of a newer piece, but um, of course, as we've talked about, I love like this GIF because you can see how the neon moves in the piece. And so talk about the different elements and how it's moving and, you know, how, why you created it this way. Well, this is part of a series that I did on chaos because four years ago, everybody was starting to feel the stress from fires and floods and politics and all the, you know, the mass shootings. And I, this one is on fire. How appropriate that we're looking at this today. Exactly. Um, so it's a specialty transformer so that the tubes on the top that are moving around, they, they are on a specialty transformer that handles five different tubes. So typically when you animate, you would have to have a transformer for each tube that animates. So this can actually controls five different tubes and I don't program it, it comes pre-programmed. I can tell them to make different adjustments, but um, then the bottom tube that are just staying on, they're on us what's called a specialty transformer called a bead maker. Okay. And you can see the gas inside the glass looks like it's beading. And that's because the gas likes to bead. Um, but if you put it on this transformer, it stabilizes the beading. Cool. And, you know, most of your work, we're only looking at still images of your work. So that's why I wanted to show this one. So everybody could get an idea of what a lot of your work looks like in action, like seeing it in person. Um, yeah, and the background, which you can't really see that well, is of a burning building that I've kind of abstracted. Oh, so it's fire and on top of fire. Yeah. And I was going to ask too, like the, the neon is the thing that <laughs> takes the foreground in all of your works, but you seem to put a lot of work into the background pieces. Um, what is your usual approach to like, what's the background going to be for these bends you've, you've made? Well, I started out initially in the early, early days of using reflective plain colored uh, plexiglass like black plexi and, and getting the reflections off of that. Then I started adding acrylic rods on top of on top of the the tube so that you got more reflections. And then I started using textures that I would put behind and textures I would put in front. And then I started because I take a lot of pictures. I started putting um, prints prints behind. And this one, um, it's. It's a, something I get printed at um, FedEx that has a sticky back, so it, it, it goes on fairly in sticks. Cool. And these, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sam. No, I was just going to ask, what, what, where do you start? Do you usually start with the tube and I'm going to follow the bends that I'm finding and then build the piece from there, or...? Well, when I was doing fire, I think what I did was I made the background first so that I could know where I could put the neon that would be most effectively. And then I looked at flames and I bent up the flames and I kind of start from different places. Sometimes I just have a bunch of glass that I've been playing around and bending up and then I'll start picking up pieces and putting them together to see if anything talks to each other and then I'll put a piece together like that. Um, Sometimes I completely plan it out in advance. Um, like if I'm going to do an animation and I'll pick out the colors and, and I'll actually design it in, in After Effects. Very cool. Yeah. I have, I think, uh, coming up, there's an example of like the boxes that you use. There's, you could see like a side view, but also like all of the, the transformers and the the background stuff it's in like three inches is that mm -hmm. like the the, the usually it's about boxes? four inches so usually the boxes that i build are about four inches so there's enough room to hide all the stuff unlike most people who work with neon i hide all of the infrastructure yeah yeah so it, it creates a cleaner kind of painterly look 
definitely. And the neon stands out and that's what you want, you know, to focus on that. Um, I love, you know, these two are earlier pieces and these are the garden pieces that I was talking about. Uh, what prompted you to, you know, to create the garden pieces? Was it because you were gardening or your dad or was there something going on at the time? Um, I wanted to, because I work abstractly, I thought I would give people some context. And so this was kind of my interpretation <clears throat> of a green bean. I started out with green beans um, and they kind of grow in kind of a wiggly kind of way. They look like cactus to a lot of people. Um, but the soybeans, I mean, it's like the one on the right are, is called soybeans and they're actually spotted soybeans. And so I looked at the colors and then the one on the left, um, <clears throat> I can't remember the name of it. Um, but it's 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 I, it's the Chinese long bean or the Japanese. They, they both have the really long beans. Um, and I like here also, you know, which you're you do in a lot of your work is you bring other elements. You know, like here you're using the netting, the kind of the almost the trellis-like feature, um, and you do that, you know, in different ways in a lot of your works. Yeah, well, that's because like when you grow beans, you have to have them on a trellis. Yeah. But it also, because they were extending off of the background, it was a way of protecting the glass from getting broken. And that makes sense. Um, and then this is another series that you did. And I think just so um, I wanted to show, let's see. Yeah, I have, oops, hopefully, ow, no. <laughs> um, I wanted to show this one just because I love the background and, um, you know, so tell us about this piece in the series that, you know, came out of it. Well, this was also part of my chaos sequence. And this is, and I was trying to capture the energy of Donald Trump. And so it animates in kind of this erratic way. And that was intentional. <laughs> And this one, I think, is 7,000 lies? 7,000. I did three of them. 7,000, 8,000, and 9,000 lies. And I actually sold 8,000 lies on the day that it was counted that he had told 8,000 lies. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, have you always, like, or not always, because I guess it depends on the piece, but, you know, like in this piece, is the back lit up, or is it painted, or how do you get the effect of the yellow? Oh, that's, that's a back, back look tube. Okay. So that stays on. And then the tube, that's the circle on, on the surface, that also animates. So they all kind of flash and animate. Um, and this back, this, this circle piece was re recycled. Um, it was something else. And I did it an earlier series. And I then I, the series. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I went back into, the only one that still exists is the one on the far right. The, the the other two I, I recycled. So tell us about the text. When, you know, you've used text in quite a bit of your work. Um, you know, why? And what is the message that you want to get out there? Um, I read a lot and, and I have like these little pet phrases of mine that are kind of my guide points that I'm, sh I'm sharing with people like, Give up what holds you down comes from a song. Um, change is the only constant. That's one of my phrases. Um, and it's not all about you. I mean, it's just things that kind of strike me. Um, and I use, I intentionally don't use, make my text neon um, because then it becomes like a sign. So whenever I use text, it's always, it's always written. Yeah. Let's see. And then your connection series that I, Shelly and I are in. <laughs> um, so I, you know, this series is completely diff, not different, but it's an, it, you know, a brand new series that you did 
Um, and you know, also you have an extensive yoga practice. You know, you're it's part of who you are, and your work it it is very zen like, very um what's the word? I don't want to say meditative. It. Yeah, I say meditative, but you know, it's all about peace and all about understanding and all about, you know, wanting to have a better world. And I mean, this connection series, you know, really brings us together and kind of brings that together too. So what prompted you to make this series? I was, um, obviously I was very unhappy about the divisiveness and the racism. And so I decided to gather, I mean, I know so many different people. And so I created a spreadsheet and looked at the demographics of California and basically broke, I, so I decided that I had to have at least X amount of people over age 60 and X amount of people under age 20 and X amount of people in between. I had to have a certain amount of white people and Latinx and LGBTQ and, um, disabled. And then when I put the first panel together, I realized I had no blondes. So then I, I, I put blonde in there as so I have to have at least one blonde. Especially in California. That's going to be a big thing. <laughs> yeah. I used to be. <laughs> so it was just, it, so I, I did five of these and I just, just, it was really interesting. It was a lot of fun collecting the images and stuff. And then I did, um, that I, I did the complement to this. So this was like the local version. And then with the um, international, so I, I took samples of textures from each of the seven continents. And that was the background. So they were complementary. That was kind of the global look at our connectedness. Yeah. Um, and this was kind of the local version. And I love how you use the chains to connect the pieces too. You know, it really brings it together. Yeah, and when I installed them, I, I connected them all together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, this piece, you know, seeing like this work all together. Tell us about, you know, what this work is about. Well, this was a, a series that we called Enlightened Systems. And it started from the one in the middle. Um, it was a quote from Black Elk, all things are our relatives. And so I, I, in the pieces, I illustrated different things that would be part of, of the whole. So before they had, um, before the Greeks came along, that people believed that everything, mountains, trees, rocks, people, animals, were all equal. And then the Greeks came along and said, no, people are above everybody else. And so that kind of changed our approach to the environment, the nature, and that kind of thing. So in the bottom corner, the bottom left corner, is a piece called Seeds. And then we have Sage, and then we have Wildflowers. And then above that, from left to right, there's Weeds. That was when we had a really, really, really rainy season, and I had like seven foot tall weeds in my backyard. Um, <laughs> And then there was this collage in the middle and then my abstraction of Donald Trump. <laughs> and then at the top on the left is clouds and, um, and then that's a bird and then a sequoia tree. It's such the, a great series to see it all together in one. It really tells a story. I also, yeah, I like the way that like the ground upness of it really works. I've always liked the the red bird piece, and it's it's even better seeing it in this like spread out grid. Mm. Well, it's red goose, and there is no such thing as red goose, so it's either gone extinct or it's yet to come. Oh, there we go. I like that. I do like the sequoia too. Definitely. Um, and then this one, um, I I. Just love this one. Is this part of the Chaos series also? Yes. Okay. And this and, is Flood. And I know in other work, you've had the neon sticking off of the piece, like, you know, extending out. 
but like in this piece especially you can really see the dimensionality you know of coming out towards us to the sides um you know was that an experiment or you know what made you decide to kind of extend extend the neon beyond the piece well i had some art friends at one of my shows and one of the artists was say, saying why don't you go off you know the the palette that would be so cool and i thought yeah i did that one time like in my very first piece that i designed and it was a pain in the butt to move around because you had to be so yeah. careful with it. So I decided to try with that again, because I do like the idea. And I just had to figure out how I was going to store it and carry it so I wouldn't be breaking the glass. Now on fire and flood, what I did was I thought I might hang them at an angle. So I had a special construction so that I could actually tilt them. But when we went to install it, it, it didn't, didn't add anything. So okay. I just hung it straight. And I love, like on this one, after talking, you know, after what you said at the beginning, the um, swirly pieces at the bottom remind me of the pipe cleaner on the pencil. <laughs> yep. So, you know, you keep that in your work too. You know, those ideas continue, you know, in different ways, in the way that you bend and form. And, you know, I love seeing that. So like the two side pieces that are sticking out, those are actually to a pattern. Oh, okay. So it gives you a different effect. Did you draw the pattern ahead of time or? Yes. Okay. It's still your, your design though. You right. Know, even if it's to a pattern. And the, and the thing is, is it's abstract. So it, it, it all fits in. It just gives you a different layer because it's, it's hard sometimes to stack the loopy stuff on top of its, each other, whereas with a flat surface, it's easier to layer stuff. It does, it does really give you that effect of water coming at you, though. It does. Things, like white kind of symmetrical bits coming out to the side and then the roiling white down in front and this kind of splashing blue coming up through the middle. Definitely. And then these two pieces that are kind of bookends to each other. Tell us about, you know, the story behind these pieces. Well, I witnessed a discussion between three people and none of them were listening to each other. And so the conversation escalated to almost a like shouting match. And the irony of it was, they were agreeing with each other, but they couldn't hear each other, so they didn't know they were in agreement. <laughs> and so it's one side of the story and the other side of the story. Yeah, I just love the idea behind this work. And then to see it in person and to see, you know, what you've done with the background too. You know, I love how you play with that. Yeah, the background on the left side were a bunch of washers. So I started with the washers in one place and I sprayed and then I'd move them around and spray and I just kept moving them around so that I would have different dimensionality to it. Cool. And then I wanted to show your collaboration with Tracy. And you know, it's really interesting because um, when I put the, this work up here, I had a couple different pictures of it. And I know you've done a couple different pieces with Tracy. I thought you did. Yes, I've done two. Yeah. And so now that I'm looking at these, I realize it's the same piece. <laughs> 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 it was like, because the reflections in the first one, you know, play off of the clear plastic. And it's such a different way than looking at it straight on. <laughs> yes. Um, so tell us about the collaboration and you know you you went I mean you've like expanded of course adding on like Tracy's elements but you know you were you've talked about that piece on the top also so tell us about that um, well Tracy takes clear plastic bottles and she cuts them into strips and then she weaves together these flower like shapes and I was doing a studio visit with her and she gave me one. So I came home and I hung it on my mirror in my office and I was looking at it one day and I'm like, that would look so cool with neon. <laughs> and so I asked her if we could collaborate. She said, yes. And so on the first piece, 
I hung the neon behind. So you can't really see it here, but the background is a, a plexiglass reflective mirror. Um, the first one was pink, this one is blue. And um, so the first one I hung the plastic behind the tubes and this one I hung it in front of the tubes. Cool. And this is part of a series called Plan B. And I have more of that work coming up okay. too. There's also a fun thing too in that switch from dead on to the side where the, the way that it reflects because of the curves and the plastic, you get all of the different colors mixed there. And almost on the left side, it feels like like Tokyo or Seoul at night in one yeah. of the areas, right? It's like lit up and the, the reflections from the neon on the black plexiglass really like pull that out too. And then from the front, it's not simple because there's still a lot of lines, but it's so much more like clear and defined. That's a real fun change. And this is also a good example to see how thick the box is, you know, that you create mm -hmm. the work on also, seeing it from the side. Because I think these are from plan B. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, so where did the idea of plan B come from? That's from an essay that I read by Anne Hebert, Herbert Herbert, um, who wrote an essay, um, How to Survive the End of the Death of the World. And she recommended that you practice random acts of kindness and make things of beauty. And uh, I, needed, I needed a change from the political environment. And so I moved to Plan B. And, I, and because all of the work in this series is recycled. There's a few new elements that I added, but a lot of the tubes pre-existed. Um, and I just wanted to have fun. Which, yeah, we need to do that. And I love that. You know, we need to practice random acts of kindness mm -hmm. and create beauty and look at beauty all around us, for sure. That's what I love about your work is, you know, just it has such a profound message, every single piece. So on this, so you can see I'm, I'm going off the canvas again. And what I figured out is that I could go off any two sides, but I couldn't go off four sides. If I went off four sides, it would be impossible to handle. <laughs> I bet. But I can pack these away by, by wedging in um, stuff to keep the, the, the work from shifting around in those storage boxes. So I haven't, knock on wood, I haven't broken anything. Oh, that's good. Um, I think, let's see, and then, oh, actually, oh, that's weird. I can just sworn I, that is our last slide, but I want to make sure because I know I put in an image from, um, well, I thought I did. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> uh, from the fab. I know I did. So something, I don't know, technology, pandemic, you know, anyway. <laughs> um, so just so everybody knows what I'm talking about with fab, the fine arts building in downtown LA, where you have um, had four shows now with Michael Fleckner? Six. Six, okay. <laughs> Every year. Um, and it's the perfect location for your work. So everybody should follow you on social media, um, you know, to keep an eye out for when you guys are going to show next. I think, do you have it scheduled for next year? We do, but who knows if it'll happen. They haven't yeah. had anything. I was, we were the last show up. And then like we took down on, on March 9th and then, they installed the next show and it never opened. Yeah, yeah. And they haven't had a show since. And we're scheduled to be next January, February, but we'll have to I just don't see it happening. Yeah, but I highly recommend for anybody watching this to go, if once you do have it up again, it's amazing to see all of the neon work in that space. It's such a beautiful historic building. And you know, with the neon, yeah, it's just gorgeous. Um, so awesome. Um, what are you working on now? I'm working on incorporating, I made this little animation in After Effects of moving dots. 
And so I want to refine that, and then I'm going to combine it with neon tubes that have moving dots in it. So you're going to have dots on the screen and dots in a tube. Oh, fantastic. I mean, you're, you come from a video production background, so I'm, you know, I'm excited to see you merging the two. Me too. Yeah. I'm, 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 ex I'm excited. It's fun. It was fun doing something in After Effects that wasn't for work, because that's yeah. what I'd always used After Effects for, was making titles and backgrounds and stuff. So it was just fun playing around, just doing something. Yep, definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Linda. It was great to look at your work and to catch up and talk to you and, um, and hear about what you're working on. We can't wait to see it. And um, yeah, keep it up. Keep it up for sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, awesome. So we will see everybody next time. Bye.